Okay, <laughs> here we go. So, so Serverless Toronto user group uh, started. We started a regular function as a service developers. But before you knew it, we we started defining serverless as a new agile and new mi- mindset, and we became, became obsessed by helping businesses uh, 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 to to and to reduce the disconnect between IT and business needs, really, to help businesses move forward faster using the serverless technology stack. And you may be wondering why uh, this data reliability. Uh, topic uh, today how do we choose topics so so uh, if you remember like when we started four and a half years our tagline was that serverless is less uh, it mess and and we were looking for the clean architecture simple uh, serverless uh, services managed services that can help businesses uh, create good solutions and somehow in the process I, I i became obsessed with the work of joe amson because he's entrepreneur sharing his simple architectures outside the world and we would go through the architectural stack and then invite the companies that we see uh, in his diagrams uh, to to the meetups and looking back like maybe like 25 percent of the meetups uh, were inspired by the thing uh, uh joe amson did in the past so so uh, so compute problem. Personally, I think that co- compute problem has been solved uh, with the serverless technologies, and, and and there is more mass in the data. So we started addressing the, the data, uh, modern data stack topics, and we had a meetup uh, about five trend. Last meetup was with Segment CDP platform. Uh, we had a talk uh, from Looker, uh, uh, Leah. And then uh, we had Felipe Hoffa from Snowflake talk about that. A couple talks about Google BigQuery. And then looking back of the stuff that's missing, like when you look at the people, uh, at, at the pains, people at work around me, like every company wants to be data-driven company. But if you have bad data or if your pipelines are not uh, good, like this data-driven decision-making dream uh, kind of goes away. Nothing happens. And I started listening to every YouTube video, like uh, reading everything I could from all these vendors and fell in love with the way Igor is teaching. And I have not even used his product. So I've never seen it, but just the way he teaches is so inspiring that I asked Igor to, to make the collage out of the highlights of the topics I liked in his presentations where I've seen people struggling and to present uh, to you. But before I give microphone to Igor, I want to i tell you that I hope that to see you next month with us. We're going to have Joe Emerson second time visiting us. This time it's his fifth unicorn uh, comp- uh, startup that became a unicorn and he's going to uh, share uh, the story about that. He's writing a book right now and he's going to go probably with some through some architectures that we did not see. So we have more topics for the future to cover. And then if you stay until the end of the meetup, uh, you will be eligible for Manning uh, Publications Raffle, any of their products. So thank you Manning for being a sponsor. And now Igor, Thank you so much for, for responding to our uh, invite and please take it away. We honored. Awesome. Thank you, Daniel. It's a pleasure to be here. And that was a very humbling um, introduction. Uh, I definitely appreciate it. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Igor. I'm the co-founder and CTO here at Big Eye. We are a data reliability platform. Uh, we help teams um, understand when their data is fit for use or not. And uh, help them manage all of this information and take action on it and make sure that they're not sur- unpleasantly surprised by any data problems. Uh, so today, uh, Daniel asked me to talk about data reliability engineering, uh, sort of where did it come from, what does it look like today, and where is it going? So this was actually a really interesting topic for me. A lot of some of this stuff I've pulled from previous talks. So. Apologies if you've seen some of my slides before, but some of this is brand new material. So this will be a very uh, an, an exciting journey for all of us because I'm going to try something new. And I enjoy doing that. Um, typically, the way that I enjoy uh, like doing my talks is to keep this as interactive as possible. If you have any questions along the way, either about the topic on the slide, anything I talked about previously, Feel free to throw them into chat. I'm going to, I'll monitor the chat I'll, um, and answer any questions that you might have. Um, also, I am happy to talk about any data topics. It doesn't have to be data reliability. I have been in the data space for over a decade now, and I uh, have seen a little bit of everything. So with, with, that, uh, with that in mind, I will uh, start my presentation. And finally, to Daniel's point, hasn't seen the product. I uh, would be happy to do a quick uh, couple minute demo at the very end of what does Big Eye look like, um, just so that it's less words and more visual, and you can get a better sense for what what do we actually do? Because I feel like a lot of times enterprise software just isn't that clear. 
Um, so with that, let's kick it off and make sure that my screen share works the right way. Uh, share a window. Uh, and it's let's... not really a big deal. You, you are repeating it. It's like a collage. Like people go to church every week, hear the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 sometimes I feel like it is, uh, it is definitely Groundhog's Day in terms of some of my talks. That's why I like to keep it interesting for my own self, too. I, <laughs> I want to make sure that I stay, I stay interested in the things that I talk about. Thank you. Um, awesome. So um, windows got really dark in here. Um, all right, let's get going. So let's uh, data reliability engineering, past, present, and future. Let's get straight into it. Very obvious agenda. We're going to do a quick intro, past, present, and future, and then a demo. I didn't have a fifth bullet point. Sorry about that. So uh, as I mentioned before, my name is Igor, co-founder and CTO at uh, Big Eye. Before this, I was at Uber. I was one of the first people called a data engineer there. They were migrating from a bunch of Postgres replicas into a proper data warehouse. Um, and my team was responsible for migrating all of those workloads, setting up all the tooling that we need to scale, and um, supporting all of the business, internal users and workloads that uh, existed on the warehouse at the time. Uh, the Uber was a really interesting company from the perspective that everyone had access to data. There was an internal tool called Query Builder. It was a web page with a web uh, with a form in it, and you could write some SQL, and you could push a button, and it sends it to the database. And good luck. I hope the database survives. And our team inherited that workflow. We had hundreds to thousands of weekly active uh, users on the warehouse, all submitting queries that we can predict. And so a lot of the work that we did was to scale our own operations. How do we model this data? How do we migrate uh, people's workloads onto the model tables? How do we deprecate tables? How do we build ETLs faster and enable other teams to pre-process their data? How do we track that the data is loading on time? All of these questions that today are known as data ops, we had to build tooling around because we had a very unique environment. Now, a lot of big tech companies, Fang++, plus plus, I know it's not Fang, it's what Mana now, Manga, I forget what they're called now. The big big tech plus Airbnb, uh, Lyft, Uber, uh, Pinterest, they all built internal tooling to solve for these problems. And when my co-founder and I uh, went out to every other company, we said, do you deal with the same problems? And they said, yes, data quality is a problem. I show my um, report to my CEO, and the CEO says, something's broken here. And now I have to spend my weekend figuring out which number is wrong and why and where did it come from. And that inspired us to build uh, Big Eye as a way to provide the sort of tooling that everyone needs in order to scale a data organization and let data engineers and pr uh, data practitioners get back to the stuff that they actually enjoy doing, building machine learning models, uh, new pipelines, expl exploration, analytics, so on and so forth. So, why, so uh, beyond our own experience, beyond our own asking people about it, what is actually, what do, happens across uh, the industry? Well, data quality is a, a problem everywhere. Uh, Gartner uh, estimated that an organization on average uh, loses 12 and uh, almost $13 million a year just due to poor data quality. And this might be because you are making incorrect decisions, because you're outside of compliance, because you're not stocking, uh, your inventory is not being restocked soon enough because you're dropping orders on the ground uh, in your pipelines, whatever that is. And you can imagine that for uh, some of you at smaller organizations, for ourselves at Big Eye, we don't even have $13 million to lose a year, uh, which re in reality means that this is an even larger problem at the higher end of the spectrum. All your um, big banks, Fortune 500s, are probably losing on the order of 50 to $100 million a year just because data quality is poor. And so the, now that there's this conversation around data observability and reliability, this is the right time to start understanding what sorts of problems are people experiencing and what sorts of solutions can we even provide to them in order to mitigate some of these problems. 
So how did let's talk about how we even got here to begin with. Well, data engineering is evolving and it's following a very similar path to what software engineering uh, did in the early 2000s. So it's actually extremely appropriate serverless uh, uh, for serverless Toronto. Serverless was a revolution in terms of how to easily deploy software. All you had to worry about is writing the code, build, uh, creating the API, putting it somewhere, and you don't worry about it. It works. The application runs, the API is available. It's going to do uh, some logic. Before the 2000s, you had a closet, and there was a rack in a closet, and you put the uh, machine in the, in the rack, and then you deployed it on the, on the machine, and then you, if you need to scale up, you buy another machine, and you stick it in the rack, so on and so forth. With the advent of AWS, um, followed by GCP and Azure, infrastructure became easier. And now there was a second order problem of, well, how do we get things deployed to that infrastructure? And then the question around deployment automation led to tooling like uh, Jenkins and CICD and all of these um, auto, all of this automation around getting code from a developer's computer to production and uh, merged in. So now that that problem was solved, now developers were able to spin up servers or not spin up servers, uh, write their code, get it into production, um, get it all working. And now there was the problem of, well, now I have one engineer who is really running th three, four, five services in the cloud, and they all have different APIs, and they all have different availabilities, and we need to understand what they're all doing, and they're all interacting with each other in unpredictable ways. And so that led to the creation of the monitoring observability space in software, which is really um, was spearheaded by companies like Splunk, Datadog, New Relic, AppDynamics, the companies that help you understand what is your software doing. So this is the state of the world in software. Obviously, we're still evolving and uh, growing on that front. But let's take a look at how this correlates back to data. Well, data has had the same problems that software has had, except for everything has been shifted by about a decade or so. If you think about infrastructure, data infrastructure today is a solved problem. But even when I was at Uber in 2014, this it's not doesn't seem that oh eight years ago. <laughs> wow. Um, so even even eight years ago, we bought Vertica, and Vertica had to be deployed on physical machines in a data center, and we had physical machines running uh, running a package, and we if we wanted to expand our cluster, we bought more machines. And cloud warehouses really became prominent after Snowflake. Redshift sort of dropped the ball on this. Don't tell if you're at AWS, I'm sorry, but it's true. Uh, Redshift was the original cloud warehouse. They could have gone there. Snowflake beat them to the punch um, and is now really considered the dominant cloud warehouse, although BigQuery by revenue is larger than Snowflake, uh, but Google does some tricky things around that. Um, regardless. Data infrastructure is now easy. It is now easy for me. I, as the co-founder of a, at that point was a five-person company, I went to Snowflake and I pushed a button and I had a, a, a warehouse that I could load data into and I could query it and I can do things from it. Great, so now we have all of this data coming in. Awesome, I have my marketing data and my internal application data and my sales data all feeding into one system. Now I wanna do some reporting on it. Well. I'm so tired of doing all these joins. I don't want to be processing all this. I need to like manage this better. Great. Let me do some data modeling. I need some uh, ETL frameworks. I need to push this data in rather than scripting it myself in my Airflow job. I'm, I go to Fivetran. And I now go and I enable a bunch of connectors. And now I don't have to run my own Airflow jobs. I can just load data into the warehouse because something else is managing that for me. And so that was the second order problem for data. So now you have a lot of easy access to data, easy access to uh, compute and storage that scales well. And now you have, in the same way that you've had that one uh, software engineer managing five different services, you have one data engineer managing possibly 500 different tables. 
And data scales much, much, much faster. If you think about software, software scales at the rate of how fast can I write code? Data scales at how fast can I go and enable a new connector in Fivetran, which becomes terrifying because I enable one connector, I now have 50 different tables with 50 different concepts, and I, as a data engineer, have no idea what they're doing. And I really hope they're all correct. And so then the problem that we faced at Uber that everyone faces here, if you've ever had to deal with a data system, is you somebody built something using that data, makes a decision, and it's wrong. The dashboard's broken. There's no data for yesterday. The data's stale. The, there are zero sales for last week. And now there's panic. And ever, the whole organization freaks out and says, what's the data team doing? Why is the data team not uh, giving me bad data? But it's not the data team's fault. It's the, it's a, they are a victim of the scale uh, that data teams operate at today and the ease with which it, uh, we were able to start ingesting the data. And this is the need for data reliability. This is when data reliability comes in and says, how do we build the processes and, what, uh, and how do we have the tools that we need in order to ensure that the data that we're using and the data that we're presenting to our users and stakeholders is correct, or maybe if not correct, at least conforming to the my assumptions of it, which is the exact corollary to what SRE does for software. So with that, let's jump into reliability. I drew that core, uh, I drew that connection between software engineering and data engineering to, to draw this connection, which is SRE is a well, no, well understood, well known concept now. Google wrote a whole book about it. It's how do you manage software re uh, reliability at scale? And so what is SRE? Well, it's a set of principles and practices that helps soft, uh, that takes software engineering and applies them to infrastructure and operations problems. How do you manage software? How do you deploy it? How do you run it? And the goal is to have scalable and reliable software systems. And Google declared these seven principles of that the teams need to uh, internalize in order to have reliable software. And they have built tooling around this. And this is now a solved problem. This is a well-known practice. Now, if we think about the need for SRE evolving out of that a scaling, a scaling up of software, then we can also see the need for data reliability engineering evolving out of the scale of, uh, of modern data stacks. And so what's data reliability engineering? Principles are the same. You might notice nothing changed on the right-hand side of the slide. But the way that I like to uh, frame it is data reliability engineering is treating data quality like it's an engineering problem. In the same way that SRE applies engineering principles and practices to infrastructure and operations, data reliability engineering is about taking the same principles and applying them to data and data quality. And so what are these practices? What are the tools that we need that to make sure that the data that you're using in all of your important applications and in your decision making isn't broken and you your team can stay moving fast in the same way that SRE allows developers to deploy applications quickly and iteratively. Data reliability engineers help teams make decisions from data quicker and more having more trust in their data and in their decision making process. So that was a very long intro. I'm going to take a pause here. The next one's going to be passed. Um, I will pause for five seconds for questions if there's anything that was a, I talked for a long time. No. no. OK, let's keep going. Great. Let's talk about the past of data reliability and uh, kind of build off of these SRE uh, and DRE uh, correlations. So if you look at SRE, th there are a set of well-known practices and um, tools that you can use in order to understand whether applications work correctly. There's a lot of, there's cloud tooling. Everything has a system status now. Green check boxes and, uh, are everywhere in the world now. And this green checkbox tells the user of the application of uh, your service that everything is working correctly. So what did this look like for data? And when I say past, I'm talking, let's say eight years ago, 10 years ago, what did this look like for data teams? And honestly, some data teams are still in this mode. 
Well, if somebody wants to ask, is my report working correctly? Oftentimes it's, I have this giant Excel spreadsheet or this giant SQL query, and I have to find the one number that looks wrong in this whole thing. And that's impossible. There's no green check mark. There's no red check. Uh, there's no green or red check box here. It's simply good luck. This is your whole report. Figure it out. And this is where you get into the problems of, well, executives look at uh, look at the report and they have a business knowledge that's deeper than the analyst. And they go to a place and say, in in the example of Uber, um, this was this is a real story. The CEO saw a report where. Uh, numbers in Brazil were lower week over week. And then um, he said, that's impossible. I know we ran a campaign in Brazil. I know they're not lower. Something's wrong with the data. The person, the stakeholder at the end of the day has to catch the fact that the report is not working well. There's no green checkbox, no red checkbox. This is untenable. You're scaling at the, not only at the um, speed of hiring more people, having more people look at reports. And some companies have whole teams just looking at reports. But that not only are you scaling that way, you're also costing valuable time and energy from typically the most important and busy stakeholders in your organization. Second concept, you know that something's broken. You already, you found out there's a red checkbox in your application. The status page uh, isn't all green. Why is it broken? How do you do that in software? You have Datadog, New Relic, App Dynamics. I'm not going to discriminate. They all do about the same thing. But you have a dashboard. And the dashboard tells you information about what's going on in your application. Maybe there's a specific endpoint that's broken. Maybe it's a query that you're issuing against your transactional database that takes a lot of time and it's uh, starting to hang up a bunch of your uh, APIs. So this amount of visibility into what is going on with your application and with your systems is considered common practice now. Nobody deploys applications without having some form of monitoring. Even AWS, if you're deploying something on AWS, they will give you the bare bones of how many, what's the QPS and what's the latency on your requests? At least you get something there. What do you, what do you get with data? What happens when you ask somebody, why is my report broken? I don't know. The VP might say, hey, something's going wrong here. And the data engineer will say, I'll look into it. And then they're going to go run a query. And they're going to run a query that looks something like this uh, dashboard, which is, I expect about 12% of values to be null in this column, but I don't know how many nulls do I have in this column. And I know it's non-zero, but I also know it's not 100. So let me go draw a line somewhere. And let me go do all this manual work here. And this is untenable. Everyone kind of has to do their own investigation. There's no central place that a data team could go to 10 years ago to say, what does my the state of the world look like for me? Now, Infrastructure aside, infrastructure was a little bit better because it's always been a little bit ahead. For example, I could tell you for my Vertica cluster, which node had a high CPU or not, but I couldn't tell you that my table didn't load for the last 24 hours. Or I expected to load 10,000 records yesterday and I've only loaded 5,000. That is all considered broken, but I don't know why. And whenever anyone would ask us a question, we'd have to go in and do the investigation. And probably the most frustrating part about all this for data teams is every time you ask this, there is always a Slack channel. There's always something internally where every single data stakeholder goes to and says, why is this query broken? Why is my report broken? Why do I not see the numbers I expect? And without having a dashboard to point to, it's all ad hoc, completely unscalable. You can't do that. So now we know that the report's broken. Now we know why it's broken. Well, what's next? What's causing it to break, right? What broke your application? APM. This is really cool. I have an endpoint. And I can go from my endpoint through the code that ran. And I can tell you what through, uh, what, where the exception was. And I know that that bubbled up the exception. And now I know what's going on. 
an APM is a solved problem. And now I can tell you exactly like, oh yeah, great. I have a 5% error rate. I know I have a 5% error rate. Guess what? They're all coming from this one method that uh, I just um, updated. I didn't show, I'm not going to show like all the trace back to GitHub, but application software, uh, the software world has this concept of let me trace through my logic to understand why are things breaking. So same corollary, what, what does this look like in the data, in the data world uh, 10 years ago? Well, I'm going to go look at GitHub and maybe someone made a change to my data pipe, to my pipeline. And maybe it's, maybe it's in DBT and let me go read the source code and like do some debugging and then go, let me go on Slack and ask people like, did anyone change this? What's going on? Like, when is this going to get fixed? What's actually breaking it? No idea. And this is, like I said, completely untenable. And honestly, it's de demoralizing. The f like some data teams just do this stuff all day. Answer your questions. What broke? How is it broken? Why is it broken? How do I fix it? And that, that's, a, that's a, I don't want to spend my days that way. And I'm pretty sure that no other data team does as well. So enough of the past. I mean, we talked about like, this seems like a pretty dire situation. I feel like at this point, everyone's depressed and they're like, why would you ever work in data? Well, everyone who works in data is a bit of a masochist. So that's uh, the first part of it. But in reality, there are, th there are the upsides and the data world does evolve and it gets better. And so let's, ah, yeah, so, yeah, I should have known which slide was next. The re and the real problem for all of this and the real reason that we have all of these, uh, that we can't answer these questions in data is because all the off the shelf solutions are exceptionally manual. I'm gonna pick on Informatica. Again, if you use Informatica, if you're from Informatica, I'm sorry, and this is nothing personal here. I'm gonna pick on Informatica. The way that Informatica and a lot of these old school off the shelf solutions for data quality want you to operate is in an especially manual manner. They will tell you information about your data and then it will force you to encode these rules and say, well, this column should not be null. This column should look like an email address. This column has the following patterns in it, the following values. And maybe that's okay, maybe it's not. The tool is completely unopinionated. The person using the tool is opinionated and has to come in and encode this information. This leads to whole teams worth of people doing what is called data governance now, when in reality, data governance is just, let me go look at a bunch of data, try to understand it, and try to build rules around it and descriptions about what it looks like and what it should look like. So I hope this is the... Yeah. And so um, these off-the-shelf solutions for the vast majority of folks are too difficult to use, too time-consuming, too unscalable. And on top of that, they're expensive. Datadog's not expensive. I pay for whatever I use. I, if, I'm pub, if, I, if I have two services, I pay for two services. Informatica says, you're going to pay me $500,000 a year, and I'm going to connect to all of your data. And guess what? If you never end up connecting your data, and if you never set up the rules, then tough luck, you already paid me half a million dollars a year. Crappy position to be in. And finally, you have big tech. And this is the world that I, I came from uh, with Uber that just builds hyper-specific solutions to their problems. But again, that's not scalable. You don't, 99% of organizations out there can't afford a five, six, seven, 10 person team building internal tooling to tell you when your data is broken and do something about it. So some of these examples of Hyper specific solutions. Uh, we have uh, Intuit's circuit breakers, probably the most well known and simplest example of uh, data reliability. You have some data quality alerts. If the alert, uh, if the alert fires, then it fails and you can't do anything, and the pipeline doesn't continue running. Once it passes again, the pipeline can run. So very specific to their situation, built straight into their pipe, uh, uh, data pipeline framework, not generalizable at all. The concept is generalizable, implementation is not. Useless for everyone. Airbnb has Midas, 
This is an ex again a very very manual process. It's what it's effectively a giant spreadsheet. I, uh, uh, as far as I understand, which says this data set meets all of the requirements for what we would consider high quality. It gets loaded on time. It has definitions around uh, what quality means for it, and we're tracking it over time. Very manual. There's a team that built the tool, and then there's a whole other team that has to go through and certify these things and make these uh, build these assumptions. Not scalable. And then finally, Uber built. Uber loves building services. Uh, a small anecdote: at some point, there was more than one service per engineer at Uber, which was terrifying. There were two thousand engineers, and there was twenty two hundred services. How that happened? Welcome to the drawbacks of microservices. I can talk about that for about another hour, but. Um, Uber loved building services. Uber built a collection of services that helped with data quality and helped automate a lot of this information, run these tests automatically, integrate into the ETL frameworks, uh, into the querying tool. The querying tool would surface these alerts. There were test generators. They would feed, uh, pull information from lineage collectors that would then say, if this is broken, here's what's an impact. It's impacting. Here's who queries these tables. Here's how we manage these problems, how we alert them hyper specific built straight into the framework that uh, uber had nobody has what uber has for good reason too a, a lot of this is way too complex and uh, unnecessary for most teams but outside of big tech you're left with go spend a half a million dollars a year on something and then throw 10 people at it and hope that they classify and uh categorize all your data and tell the uh, tell the data what's uh, when it's right so like i said grim 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 situation uh, now um everyone's facing those same problems everyone's trying to solve the same problems there's no general solution so what happens how did we get to where we are today well a lot of people realize the same thing at the same time that data reliability is a problem and we need to start building tooling around it. And so Big Eye is one of those companies. And what, what does the world of data reliability look like today? Well, a lot of the first of all, a lot of the concepts around reli data reliability are becoming much, much clearer. Before, if the uh, concept before was I have a table and somebody has to go in here and write very manual custom uh, rules for each column in this table, then today we're starting to adapt much more around SRE principles, having SLI, service level indicators. What are we tracking in order to understand the state of my data? Not whether it's right or wrong, what is the state of it? How do we monitor it? And so those then feed into these SLO service level objectives where at what point is this considered a problem? If my table's on time 99.5% of the time, that might be OK. And then SLAs are finally those user-facing, um, the user-facing notion, and the same as the SRE has. Your application has an SLA. Guaranteed response time under a second, um, or for example, uh, uptime of three nines in, in a given month. Great, you have, a, you have an uptime SLA. You declare that, you send that to your users, and they know what to expect. And data SLAs are the same way. A data a table, a data set is really just another application. And users are going to query it. They're going to query it through SQL. They're going to pull data out. But it's still an application, still has an SLA. You still want to treat it the same way. So the concepts are starting to overlap a lot with the, uh, with the SRE concepts. Out-of-the-box solutions are becoming more automatic. There's no more go here, click. Uh, write some rules, write some SQL, schedule it, do whatever you need to do. This is a, a marketing -y version of a, of a big eye workflow where point us at your snowflake. We'll go do all the, we'll figure out what data you have, what permissions uh, big eye has, and we're just going to start monitoring things. We're just going to start looking at how often is this data updating. Is that normal? Is that within range? What were the, what, what, uh, how many historical updates did it have? Has it been updating daily all the time? Then it sounds like this table should keep updating daily. And if it stops updating daily, that's a problem. You don't need to define the rules anymore because there's enough information, there's enough metadata out there 
that you can start automating a lot of this process that historically has been very manual. And with the advent of SLIs, you have this notion of properties about the data that you can track. And now that you're tracking properties, you can find what are the common properties, nulls, distribution checks, um, uh, foreign key relationships. These are common things that you can automate, you can infer very, uh, very quickly and set up easily because they're common across every environment. And then leave all the custom stuff to the uh, person implementing uh, and integrating this, your data reliability systems. So on top of that, going back to why is my report broken? We know now we can find out that our data data is broken. We can find out that um, we know how it's broken. And we, and we found out about it first. Why is it broken? And this is where lineage comes into play. Now, if you've, if you, any of you have paid attention to um, a lot of the chatter in the data space, um, lineage is a very, very common topic nowadays. Everyone loves to talk about lineage. Where is data coming from? What, what is it impacting? What reports are downstream of it? Lineage is a very interesting concept because it's been around forever. But historically, lineage has been very manual. You, someone would have to say, here is, uh, here is what table is feeding into this. Or you had frameworks that said, I'm going to set up an ETL and I'm going to declare in my framework what tables are upstream of this and what reports are downstream of this. But cloud-based uh, APIs and a lot, uh, a lot more metadata available means that tools can start tra uh, building this lineage graph much faster and much more efficiently. Now, applications have the same thing. Um, there are plenty of tracing concepts in applications. Jaeger is actually a, a common library if you want to uh, look that up uh, for wrapping your um, endpoint requests for microservices to know which microservices get called as a result of what. It's effectively a manual Datadog APM um, uh, for microservices. But this... Tracing in software has a, the same corollary in data. And it's important. this is important in order to understand not just what is causing my report to break, but also now that I can find out about problems early, if there is a problem in my table, who's affected downstream? Who should I tell that there's something wrong with my data? And this here is an ex example of a theoretical chart. I grabbed it out of um, a um, an example screenshot, not real table names, very obviously, but it, you can see that you can start tracing if there are issues upstream, what are, what, what's being impacted downstream. You can find out how these problems are flowing through the, your data graph. And now, this isn't to say that this is an easy problem or a solved problem. There's a lot of, and I'll get into this in the future uh, section, but it is now starting to become more usable, more tractable, more automated, and l less effort involved uh, on the side of the team. So that's where we are today. So we're in a we're in a bit of a better place, and it's good. It's good. There's tooling available for this. The tooling is supporting all the common patterns and the use cases. The patterns are well known and well defined and well tested by SRE and our software friends. So what does the future of data reliability look like? Well, data reliability engineering is really just a subset of what is called data operations. Data ops is a is a common um, common phrase here, uh, the shortening of it. So once we solve the problem of data reliability engineering, how do we start, how do we instrument our data, monitor it, track it, manage the issues, communicate the issues back out to the stakeholders? That's a part of this larger picture. And the larger picture takes a lot of those inputs that we have discovered through in the process of ensuring, of building out a data reliability practice and applying them to the rest of the data uh, ecosystem. So things like access control, discovery, 
I know that this table's broken. Who cares about it? Should they be caring about it? Should anyone, should anyone even be looking at this at all? Is this table even being used, utilization? So for example, if we can instrument all our tables and we can alert people and we're finding out that this every time this table breaks, we don't know who to alert because nobody's ever touched it. There's one, maybe there was one query a, a year ago, but there is a pipeline that keeps running and we don't know who to alert anymore because it's being written into never being read. Drop the table, kill the pipeline. There you go. You saved yourself on your Snowflake bill. A lot of these things that are higher order operational problems rely on a lot of the concepts and a lot of the foundational information that we collect in the process of ensuring data reliability. And to go back to the software corollary, in the same way that SRE is just a part of operating a software uh, an infrastructure and a software uh, ecosystem, data reliability engineering is just a part of operating a data team and a data function and making sure that it works efficiently and um, scalably. So why is this in the future slide? Well, because I want to call out that this is just the start. There really is no, there is a lot more overhead here uh, and a lot more headroom in terms of what is possible from a um, tooling perspective and in terms of helping data teams be more automated and solve their problems and spend less time on the things they don't care about, they don't want to care about. So let's go jump back to reliability specifically. Well, what, what does, uh, reliability is great. It's important to know that something's broken. It's important to monitor it. But where is that information presented? So for example, let's go back to Datadog. I'm an on-call engineer. I have pager duty. Datadog has information that my service is broken. It's going to page me. It's going to present that information where I need it. I need it on my phone, and I need to know that something's broken so I can go take action. Maybe it's going to go present it on a, a dashboard. Maybe I have a Datadog dashboard up on a monitor 24-7, uh, and there's going to be a big red square that says this alert's going off. Data, does, data reliability needs to move in the same direction. The information needs to be where users need it. And for the purposes of data, this means at query time, at discovery time, the information about what is the state of the data and can I trust it needs to be presented then. So what, I, what I'm showing you here is a screenshot of Alation. Alation is a data catalog. Data catalogs are a whole category of tools that are used in order to help users find data that they need, discover it, understand how it's being used, understand how uh, where it lives, whether they have access to it or not. Because this is the starting place for a lot of users, uh, data users in on their journey of building, doing something with the data, analyzing and building a report, the information about the reliability of the data should really be presented here. And I, wh where else? What about at query time? I don't even have a good screenshot for this. No one's done this yet. Pop SQL is getting close to it. They're a tiny, uh, they're a small little startup, but they're getting close to it where I want to write a query. I want to start typing select month uh, sum of sales from my sales table. And when I'm typing that query, I should be able to see you're about to query the sales table. We know there's a problem with it. We know there, uh, that the data has been delayed and there's no data for the last uh, two days. Are you sure you still want to run this? Because you're going to get results that you don't expect. Great. I should find out about it then. I shouldn't have to run that query, get the data back, and then find out that something's broken. Putting that information where the users would access it, where it would be most relevant to their workflow is really what's going to make data reliability truly prominent and actually useful within an organization. It's great that we have the tools to compute it. We need to push it out. In this case, Big Eye, we at Big Eye have an integration with Alation. We push our information into Alation for any of our customers that use both products. And that allows uh, those customers to get that information where they need it. Otherwise, 
they have another tool. Big Eye can message Slack, but still users have to go back to Big Eye. We want, ideally, we would want them to stay in the workflows and the tools that they need in order to do their job and put that information there. And so going back to the information that we need to present, something that is sorely missing is the standardization of information in the data space. So if you think about going back to the software analogy, if you think about software, there are standards. There are standards around how you collect metrics, how they're stored. Uh, there are API standards for how do you rep uh, report metrics out of your application. There are known concepts like counters and gauges and timers, and they are repeated across every single monitoring uh, solution that you have. Applications have a standard way of reporting things back up. Servers have a standard way of reporting things back up. It is trivial for me to say, what is the CPU utilization of my server? Every machine will do that, and it'll do it in the same way. And it's very easy for me to understand that. It is very easy for me to understand how much memory my uh, Docker container is using. And it doesn't matter if it's a Docker container or a, a Java application running on a server or Python, whatever it is, I can find out how much memory it's using. It's always the same. Data is not. Data has is too heterogeneous. There are too many custom implementations of everything around, even at the level of the infrastructure. In the same way that you can easily report CPU utilization, I can't always easily under, even know which tables exist in a database. We here at Big Eye have to <laughs> have to pull information about which tables we can see so our users can monitor them, we support 14 different databases. The number of if-else statements I have in that code path is astonishing. Everyone is different. And you, you might say, JD, well, JDBC is a standard, and everyone uses JDBC, so why don't you use J, the JDBC methods? It's not how it works. Apparently, no, because everyone gets to decide how they want to implement JDBC and have their own <laughs> interpretations of the standards and of the methods and return their own res uh, different result sets. And then BigQuery is going off completely on a tangent. And they're like, well, you have to use our library and our frameworks, and we don't really fully support JDBC. And it's a little, it's a workaround mostly to get in into BI tools. And so there have been some, there has been some progress here. Um, Schemata is probably the most recent example of this where providing a protobuf standard for how to, how do you define information about tables, about metadata, which tables exist, how do you tag them, how do you provide more information around it. Um, this is in the first iteration. Open Lineage um, was a project out of Marquez. Marquez got acquired um, by Astronomer. Open Lineage has the same notion of what data model can we use in order to start consolidating information out of all of these sy different systems? And how can we make that extensible so that when new concepts appear, that data model will still work? This is all extremely nascent. There, there isn't a single solution here that's actually being adopted by anyone. And probably the only thing that's going to tip the scales here is if a major player in the data space adopts some form of standard. But there, no one's incentivized at this point. Snow, Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, no one's incentivized to do this. And everyone's going to keep doing their own custom thing. But I, I am a dreamer. And I uh, someday, it would be great if I could have just one method to say, what are the columns in my table? And have one, one way of uh, retrieving that, regardless of where I'm, what I'm querying. But this is where I see the future. And I think uh, the standardization across tools is really the uh, the future, because without standardizing this information, we're never going to be able to build the sorts of workflows and present this information in the sort of way that is useful for, for our users. And at the end of the day, that's the goal of all this data tooling. And with that, I, I want to thank you for listening to my, to my talk. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It is uh, top of the hour. Um, Happy to take any questions live and chat. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot. Well, thank you so much. I, I hope you you guys could see why why I liked Igor's teaching so much. So, so but but for companies like 
I would eventually want you to go through the demo of Big Eye as well. But like for somebody who is starting from custom scripts, like the pain you described, and jumping in the tool, it's a big gap. And then open source tools are very often mousetraps to get you into the paid version as well. So, so how do you navigate uh, uh, through, like in, at one of the talks you were talking about different use cases, different commercial vendors do, and, and like it's the same problem everybody's solving, so I think sharing helps. And some of the communities even deleted the post when I invited them uh, here. So, yeah, maybe. sharing helps. Open source, I. It's a it's a double edged sword. the The problem is there's no true open source uh, company that will actually make uh, make money. Everyone who makes money on open source ends up building so much on top of the open source that there's no open source left on, underneath. Think uh, even think about things like Cloudera, Confluent, um, uh, Hortonworks. All of these companies started with open source and then built their own layers on top of it to solve the real problems that people cared about. Open source is a framework. Open source, you can use it, you can solve the problems that you uh, you have, but it's really just a starting point. And the value is in helping with those user workflows. Now, to your point. Yes, starting off with your own scripts. If you want to start off with something small, if you have a team of 10 people and you have one data engineer and you have like 10 pipelines, yeah, great. Go pull down great expectations. Go pull, uh, if you're using DBT, use DBT tests. You probably don't need that much more than that anyways. Um, the important thing to understand though is the rate at which teams scale out of that is phenomenal. Even we here at Big Eye have, we started with dbt we have dbt we model our data that way we have some tests and we are at this point we're at a point where we're like yeah this doesn't scale no one is going to go update these tests no one's going to write them we just changed the schema and now we have to go update three different files in order to uh, account for that we don't want to do that so now we need better tooling um same with same with a lot of different data concepts like you just need you will grow out of it and the other part of uh, the point I usually like to make about open source and building your own, rolling your own solution, whether that be data solutions or software solutions, is think about what the core value proposition of your business is. If the core value prop of your business is not building data engineering tools and building data ops tools, why are you building it? We, I, I personally, as a, as a CTO, I stand by this. I tell my engineers, buy it. Why are we building it? We do not need to build workflow tools. We do not need to reinvent the wheel on databases or ORMs. Use what's on the shelf. It will probably get us 90% of the way there because that's not our core value prop. Our core value prop is monitoring data at scale. We do a lot of custom work around connecting the databases, uh, generating the right queries, filtering th them down, making sure we respect partitioning. All of this is highly custom because that's core value to us. All of the infrastructure stuff, not core value. So I'm not going to build it, I'll pay for it. And typically, a vast majority of data teams are not core value to the business. They are um, helping inform decisions. If they are, if you're a hedge fund, if you work at a hedge fund, your data matters. Build your custom solutions. If you are an e-commerce company and you want to know how many soap bars you need to stock up for next month? Data problem. <laughs> you're not a, you're not a technology company. You want you need the data to make informed decisions, and you need to know as quickly as possible that the data is correct. So, probably not a good idea to build. Um, yeah. Is this a good time for a big item, or you want to cover like in one of the meetups you were talking about? different use cases, different vendors covered that you're really not yeah. competing. Everybody's solving their own problem. Can you lighten people so they can pick and choose? Yeah. Not yeah, I more, more than happy to. I Before I get to that, I know Ravinder has a question, so I'm happy to take that um, live, and then I'll move on. Yeah, thanks a lot, Igor. So uh, I have a background of a observability engineering role, which I'm currently paying for a uh, one of the biggest Canadian retailer. Uh, you emphasized on standardizing the data. Um, unfortunately, within the enterprise, it is not practical. 
because we are dealing with the legacy applications, right? Yep. So, especially, uh, you know, I I was trying to solve a bigger use case for last two three years uh, where we were trying to handle logs, metrics, tracing, and we had a bunch of tools in our enterprise, right? Even with their presence, still we were having a lot of loose edges and it was very difficult to figure out how to stitch everything. And we did a detailed assessment of even APM tools also, like which tool is best in our use cases, right? So I'm just trying to figure out, like, is, is the big eye fits in which segment? Is it handling all three pillars of observability? Or is it focused on specific two, two, two areas, say metrics and tracing? So that's what I'm not I'm not clear, actually. Yeah. So uh, I want to be clear that Big Eye focuses on data data observability and data reliability. So the information that is in your in your databases. So here's a here's an example of one of our uh, one of our customers. They have an application writes data into a SQL Server database. They then replicate that SQL Server data into Snowflake. They run through a bunch of pipelines, and then they build reports at the other end. What Big Eye helps them do is they we monitor the SQL Server replica and Snowflake, and we say, is the data being replicated on time? Is uh, are your fields all correct? Making uh, doing assertions around um, the data that the application doesn't do. So, for example, your sales price can never be negative. The application, if the application misses that, maybe someone writes a bug and you have negative prices, that affects reporting downstream. The application didn't catch that. Big Eye helps you catch the problems with the data. So we focus on metrics around the contents of your data. From a observability, software observability perspective, it's a lot trickier because, again, like I said, it's a much more mature market. Uh, Datadog has, what, 10, 20 modules now w doing different things. And they're actually doing a pretty good job of stitching them together. Um, Splunk, I know, is going down the same route where they are doing a pretty good job of saying, you have logs and you have metrics, and we're going to help you create unified dashboards around them. Uh, I'll get to the demo. You'll see what I mean about Big Eye, but we handle the contents of the data, not so much the applications themselves that are creating the data. Thank you. I, I think that ties in very nice into the same question I had for you. Like yep. most of us coming from the SRE and compute world, we are like focusing on this digital exhaust of the jobs running up and mm -hmm. down and whatever you can get out of them. But you reversed it. You're looking at the target. You're looking where it lands and is it supposed to be there? Yep. So that's and then at one point you were talking about uh what was it like? It's overall job. Like if you if you are focusing on digital exhaust, like it's a whole bunch of jobs in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. How they relate to you? Okay, and but you probably have to have some calendaring overlaying on top of that to see if the job is supposed to run or not. Yeah. Or like, can you walk us through that uh, same problem? Yeah. So the this is the interesting. I having been a software engineer and a data engineer, this is the really interesting part. Is Software engineering treats data as exhaust because the important part for software is my code needs to run, my logic needs to perform, and the product needs to be um, needs to work to spec. Right now, the data that you're using that is supporting the software, supporting the spec. Downstream of that, all of that data is getting sucked in by analytics teams and data engineering teams, and they take that and mash it together and try to find some sort of interesting insights. Let's say you're building an order, let's say you're building an order processing uh, framework where users can come into your shop, buy some, like add things to a cart, buy it, and um, then check out and complete the purchase, right? So great, you care about the logic of that. You care about the fact that, okay, well, orders need to be in a specific state. They can't transition state weirdly. Uh, if someone adds something to a cart that needs to persist until they remove it, when I click checkout, I need to sum up all of my uh, cart values and then build them for that. This is the sort of logic that software cares about. Everything that you save, everything that you store, all the logs you generate get sucked up by the data team. And then they say, okay, well, now let's do find something interesting here. 
what items are users are buying most often? How many orders are we placing? What, how much revenue are we generating? They, data teams care about anomalies at that level and care about insights at that level. They care about the fact that our custom, let's say the number of orders for item A went up by 200% last week. Interesting, let's go dig into that. Let's go find out, do we need to actually run a sale on item A or something? Or do we need to increase the price? They're trying to make decisions off that. Now, if all of a sudden something changed in the application and item A is now called item B because you um, started, because something changed in the code maybe, maybe the code started hashing things or whatever, right? The, the value of that changed. Now the code doesn't care, the logic performs the same way. The user, the end user of your product experiences it the same way. The data team now has to deal with the fact that the value of that item changed. And now there needs to be this understanding that something that was called item A before September 1st is now called item B. And that's all actually the same thing. And so when you're doing your analytics, that looks like the same thing. So the point of data observability is not to say the application isn't processing item B correctly. It's to say that there used to be records for item A and now there aren't any. And that's weird. And there's something going on there and that's probably affecting your analytics. And this is where one, one, person, one team's exhaust is another team's goldmine, right? What, or, and probably goldmine is, there is a lot more mining than there is gold, but it is still there. And that's the that's the goals of uh, goal of the data and uh, engineer uh, data team. And so, I'm having in order to kind of frame this better, I'll jump into a quick product demo. I'll give you a quick five second overview of what does Big Eye do? What does it look like? From there, I Daniel, I will address the question of great. Now that we know what Big Eye does, what does everyone else do? There's a lot of players in the space. There's open source solutions. There's um, proprietary solutions, what, how do they compare? So let's walk through that. So um, we talked about SRE concepts, we talked about SLAs. Let's jump straight into it. The guy has SLAs because we are a data reliability platform and we want to speak in the same concepts. Now, SLAs, for software are typically around applications, SLAs for data teams that we've seen from our customers, and this is a demo environment, but what we see is they're focused on team. What does the team care about? So for example, we have this demo environment is based on a green home. Uh, green, home uh, green Homes is a theoretical construction company that builds homes and enters contracts and sells those homes to uh, people. The, and analytics team might care about how are contracts doing? Are we selling more homes? Are we building more homes? This SLA tracks a set of metrics. Now, metrics in software land are CPU uh, util and a latency and QPS and um, maybe custom metrics that you track. Data is trickier because it's, it's heterogeneous. There are different properties that we want to track depending on the data set depending on the specific data that's inside of it. So for example, here, what we have is we have 21 metrics that all impact this dashboard that are all tracking properties about things in this dashboard, such as how many rows were inserted over time into the table that's feeding it. Now, here I can see that I, we're usually loading uh, like uh, less than 4,000 records a day. And all of a sudden, we started loading 9,000 records, probably running a job twice. Or maybe this is a real anomaly and there's a real business use case here. I can go and investigate this. Big Eye helps you find this out about the state of your data before you go to, it, you go to the dashboard and get surprised. And so the tricky part about Big Eye is how do we create all of these metrics? How do we deploy them? How do we scale that process out? And so let's talk about what Big Eye monitors. Now, Big Eye doesn't monitor applications. Excuse me. Big Eye monitors databases. So here we have 
Snowflake, Redshift, Athena, the Synapse, uh, Databricks. These are all analytical databases that data teams use. Let's go to Snowflake. Here we see we have five, we have schemas, we have a virtual schema, we have popularity. We know going back to the standardization of information, how many queries were run against tables uh, against this schema? Actually impossible to answer highly custom for every single data source. This is something we have to build custom, but we know that we know how many queries are run. We know what tables exist there. We know what these tables look like, and that doesn't have any meaning. We know what these tables look like. We can even look preview the table and we can say, look, this is what the contract table looks like. This maybe this is a sync from your transactional database into your analytical database. But now we want to track properties of this over time and know that the data isn't changing, or if it is changing, then we know how it's changing. And so Big Eye helps you set up metrics. And metrics monitor this information over time. How often is a job type valid? This is a custom metric. There are a lot of not custom metrics. How often are strings empty or uh, null or fields null? But you might have some custom business logic that says the only valid value in this column is one of remodel or new build. And I don't expect any other values. And if I get any other values, then that's a problem for my dashboard because I assume that there's only two values in this column. And so building, what Big Eye does is we help you build out this foundation of data reliability by saying, let's go to your tables, let's deploy your metrics, let's create thresholds. These thresholds are automated. Our, in the same way that Datadog has their anomaly detection on your CPU utilization that says, this is your typical range. If it goes out of this range, we'll alert you. Big Eye does the same thing for all of these metrics about the state of your data. And then we take it a step further, and we can help you debug your problem, going back to that root cause analysis. Because all of this is about your data, all metrics are really just SQL under the hood, which means we can reverse engineer it in order to understand what your assumptions are. And we can say, find every single row where my assumption is broken. Why is this metric alerting me? Because there's all of these records where the job type has an underscore in it, and we don't expect an underscore. Software engineers don't care about this. I updated an enum, and I pushed it, and my new enum with the underscore is out in production. The data team cares about this because the data team says, I already made an assumption that there's not going to be any underscores, and if a third record appears, my dashboard is going to break. My model is going to break. My machine, um, my, uh, machine learning model will retrain incorrectly. So SLAs are composed of metrics. Metrics go out of, out of range. All of this is automated, and that creates a set of issues. And issues are now just effectively task trackers. What's this? Uh, what's impacting this? Uh, what's wh what is it, this impacting downstream? Who responded to this last? And I saw Andy acknowledged it, muted it for twenty four hours. He's probably going to go fix it. Maybe he's going to drop the bad records, adjust the thresholds. Don't know yet. But Big Eye helps you start thinking about these processes in the same way that SRE thinks about these processes for software. I'm not going to bore you with all the other features. I can go on a whole feature tour. But this is the point of Big Eye, is to help you monitor your data at scale. Now, there's a lot of other solutions out there, as Daniel mentioned. There are open source solutions. Um, the difference between uh, here's one example, the um, great expectations. It's an open source framework for Spark jobs. If you have Spark jobs that are doing some computation, you can embed uh, great expectations in it and have assertions about your data there. It's great that that's in the pipeline, it's in the code. But if an assertion fails, what do you do about it? How do you notify somebody? This is in code. All, all you do is you get an email that says an assertion has failed. Now what? There's no history. There's no tracking. There's no graphs. It's very powerful and very efficient for the developer, but not for the end user, not for the person doing something about that problem. And this is the point of having an external tool to sit on top of your database, on top of your pipelines, rather than being embedded in order to uh, better 
understand the whole system and give you that visibility rather than saying, go back to your pipeline, go to the code, change the code. This needs to live separately. So great expectations is awesome if you're getting started and you want to kill the pipeline. As soon as there's a null in this field, as soon as a price goes negative, stop my pipeline, stop my processing. Don't even, I don't care about this issue tracking because this is immediately invalid and I want to stop the world. Perfect. Great expert. You should totally use great expectations. If you have some form of error tolerance, then big eye and more uh, external solutions are better. And so then you have solutions like big eye and Monte Carlo and Anomalo and Metaplane. We, we all do very similar uh, things. We all do observability. The question is at what scale? Big eye is a very, very much a by the principles, we want to be the data reliability platform. You can express whatever you want because it's all metrics and metrics then get recomposed or rolled up into SLAs. They create issues. Everything is tracked through these well understood concepts. It's extremely flexible, but it's also you have to do a little bit of setup and we try to automate as much of that as possible. Other tools are geared more towards you have of 10,000 tables and you want to just monitor the basic properties of are they even being loaded on time and you can do that very efficiently but then once you start getting deeper then you're you're going to hit a dead end pretty quickly in terms of the things you can monitor so it's the trade off of between flexibility and power and automation and now here's the thing the tools are going to start converging in the same way that datadog and neural like and app dynamics and dynatrace have all effectively converged at this point from a feature perspective, the data observability space is going to converge. Um, the question is, what is it going to converge on? And this is what I think the future is yet to hold. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Everybody's so quiet. Ah, we have a, some in the chat. No mark left. Don't be shy. Igor is easy to talk to. <laughs> so there's so many what i love like you turn my world upside down it's like sweater from outside rather than looking at jobs bringing it in uh, you're looking from the inside because like every tool has a job monitoring thing but who monitors the monitor is it arriving on time yeah, yeah. and not not just that there's also what makes the space even more complex is that there are tools that monitor the jobs themselves. So for example, you have, you have a pipeline that's moving data from, going back to the example, from SQL Server to Snowflake. I pulled this table out, maybe I filter out some uh, um, PII and I strip out the emails and I strip out the names and then I dump that into Snowflake for analytics. There is a pipeline there. That pipeline runs on a schedule. It, it takes a certain amount of uh, time to run. So there are tools that just monitor those pipelines and the, the statistics about them and information about those pipelines. And that's a different problem from monitoring the contents of the data itself. Because pipeline monitors aren't going to introspect the data. They're not going to look into it and find out what's going on there. So this is where, this is where it's, uh, the space becomes very confusing because it's fairly new and it sort of everyone's kind of using the same words to mean the same things and <laughs> talk about the same problems and i think at some point there will be this like normalization of terminology and that's why i am a big proponent of let's keep stick to as close as possible to sre and as close as possible to the concepts of sre because the cons a lot of the concepts are the same it's just the application of them is slightly different. That is awesome. Be before yeah. you answer this question about licensing, you're talking about terminology. Data quality concept exists for a long time. It's siloed teams, well established. How do you kind of bring the gap? How do you define this versus data quality? Uh, yeah, this is, I think this is one of my favorite questions. So there are, there's the notion of, data quality now there's data reliability there's also data observability there's also uh data monitoring all of these words are in the same sphere the way that i see it is data observability which is what uh 
we do is an input to take some action about the data. It is looking at your data continuously over time in order to collect signals about what is the state of it. In the same way that software observability is collecting signals over time about the state of your application, data observability is collecting the state of your data over time. Now, that fee that signal then feeds into data reliability because those are the processes and tools that you use in order to do something about that. When something, when a signal goes haywire, what do you do about it? How do you track that? How do you um, uh, work with it? Now, data quality is sort of this balloon like mega term of like, I need to know whether my data is correct and I can use it. Good data quality means I can use it. Bad data quality means I can't. But in order for you to say yes or no to, is this a good, a good data quality or not, you need to take all these signals. You need to have all these processes in place. You need to be able to understand it and um, do something about it rather than just guess and or use manual effort. So data quality is sort of the overarching theme, but it is trying to answer the question of, can I use my data or not? And then data reliability is the practices and the tools that you need to implement in order to answer that question. Awesome, thank you. And before you answer, yeah. Ravin, there's a question about mm -hmm. licensing. I didn't see Connecta for BigQuery. Do you do that? Yeah, we do BigQuery as well. OK, so, so there's is, a question. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Ravinder, um, licensing for us. So we try to uh, do it similar to APM tools. So in the, for example, in the same way that APM does per host, per application, per, um, yeah, some APMs tool uh, uh, do memory-based, um, we do table-based. So for us, in the same way that an application is a single contained unit that you want to monitor, for data teams, a table is a single unit that they want to monitor. And what we charge on is how many tables are you monitoring? And for us, rather than looking at this in units of one, we're looking at this units in units of hundreds to thousands. Because typically teams have hundreds, thousands of tables. We have worked with some teams that have tens of thousands of tables. Now, they might not be monitoring all of them, and because not all of them might matter but we will charge them for the ones that they do monitor. Uh, we, as a fun side note, we did try volume-based at some point where we're like, the amount of monitoring you do, and we're going to, every time we issue a query to your database, we'll effectively charge a tax on that. Uh, that hard to, hard to f predict because it's hard to understand how much monitoring people want to do. And so if your data scientist says, well, now I care about this other table and I'm going to start uh, put monitoring on it and do something about it, then all of a sudden they can run up the bill and nobody likes that. So um, it's a little aside on our journey towards licensing. Oops, you're muted there, Daniel. Uh, any other questions? It's only me asking. Um, does the tool publish the the health metrics that you have, like the metadata, the metrics about the metadata, in the in the sense that you can consume it from a custom tool? Like you mentioned earlier in your talk, that you you kind of push the health metadata into mm -hmm. some sort of a query or two, and I think it was Alation or something yeah. like that. Let's say I'm not using Alation and I've got my own solution. Is there a way that in my tool I can just quickly query and get the health snapshot of what the tables are? so that I could maybe give a warning. Like I think your example was, hey, don't carry that table, it's bad right now, or something like that. The, a surprising number of our customers do exactly that. So being the engineer that I am, I built everything API first. I am, uh, in perspective, I'm a backend engineer, not a front-end engineer. I am terrible at front-end, do not make me write JavaScript. Um, so with that, the easiest way for us to get off the ground was, Let's build out all the APIs and all the concepts in the back end and have all the processing done well. So we are very much an API first company. A lot of our customers effectively scrape use us as a giant like information aggregator and processor and uh, like uh, anomaly detection tool. And then they suck the information back out and they say, great, which tables have alerts on them? Or how long, how many alerts are there? Which one's the most important? And in a interesting meta um, meta point, we actually have a customer that 
pulls the information out of Big Eye, puts that back into Snowflake, creates their own dashboard about the state of the health of their whole warehouse, and uses Big Eye to then track that own transformation and that or the table for that dashboard. Meta, I love it. It's a got it's layers a, of inception there. I, <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing. I, I'm a big fan. Um, so yes, de definitely plenty of custom integration. We also have a Python SDK if you are a Python fan. But um, yeah, um, Alexi, uh, three questions. Great. Let's take them in order. Uh, one: What's a Big Eyes data retention policy? Does it store any extracted data in an intermediate storage? We do not store any of our users' data. So the benefit of using metrics is that everything is an aggregation and there's no raw values anywhere. If I need to know the null, how many nulls I have in the table, it doesn't matter what the data under the hood is. If I need to, or for format checks, I can check that a column looks like an email without knowing what email it is. And so Big Eye only stores the sort of ag aggregated metrics and it does all the processing on that. We don't extract any data. For example, the preview screen, run a query, store it in memory. As soon as you're off that page, it's gone. Like we don't, uh, we don't store raw data for users. Um, two, can you monitor and tune up performance and efficiency of underlying Big Eye SQL queries? The the part of the magic sauce for Big Eyes, we do it ourselves. We batch. Uh, as many queries as possible. We work with scheduling around, especially for Snowflake. Snowflake is particularly um, not deceptive, but tricky to optimize for uh, for cost. Uh, for cost, it is definitely optimized for performance. And so we do a lot of work around like when should we run a, a query on Snowflake? Is has the table even updated? Do we need to recollect it? If we are collecting 100 metrics on this table, how few queries can we run? What window of time do we need to look at? And we do a lot of the optimization across the board. And for some of them, we do, uh, for Snowflake specifically, 70% of our customers use Snowflake. And so we have like Snowflake specific optimizations we do there too. Um, then can do, mon do those monitoring rules can automatically apply to new columns? And I love this question. We on and I will give you a six day sneak preview. We are releasing something around this in uh, next Tuesday, which will allow you to deploy monitoring based on what the tables and columns that appear rather than going in after the fact that after they appear and then deploy them. So yes, this is functionality like this is coming. Um, oh, thank you. And what a de-identification, de we don't do any of that. We just, the way that we treat it is if you don't want Big Eye to have access, if it's that sensitive, don't give Big Eye access to it. Um, that, that's kind of been our answer. Granted, we are a small startup that obviously doesn't work for everyone. And uh, we do have plenty of customers that run Big Eye themselves in their infrastructure. And we have like special like self-hosted deals, uh, but the vast majority of our customers are totally okay with saying, we get it, you only collect metrics. We're not gonna give you any of our financial data anyway, so that's fine. A data residency, so where are data centers? Can you choose, like I'm in Canada, it has to be in Canada. Or... Oh, the... this is where I, I am not a lawyer and I don't like to get into the legalese of this, uh, there's a whole concept of do, what is data processing, what is data storage? If we're not storing the raw data, is that actually, does that uh, fall under GDPR, CCPA, all of that uh, fun thing? So it's like, if we're collecting aggregated metrics about it, does it matter where we're storing it? Um, so far the answer seems to have been no. Even, uh, we've even talked to a few Euro European uh, companies and they pretty much said as long as it's not the raw data we don't care so that's a uh, huh. interesting maybe uh, i can contribute to that like when we had honeycomb talking with us about sr itself yeah. and honeycomb yeah. is only costed in the us and the same question uh, came up they said just use customer managed keys so therefore cloud mm. provider will not have access to the data they yeah. can still stop it like if, if not us doesn't like yeah. canada but 
Yeah. Cool. Uh, we yeah we don't have anything for that. Hasn't come up yet. But the question of would how do you deal with PII has definitely come up, and the answer has been we don't look your we don't look at your data. We don't store your data. We don't want anything to do with it. I I honestly just don't want the risk of uh, liability of looking at people's raw data. Love Not for me. Any other questions? You covered most of my questions. There was one talk you were talking about time forecasting, how you find the, what data at a level of errors, and it was a really interesting discussion you had. But like, if anybody is interested, how you can do it yourself from Snowflake Schema, something like that. Oh yeah. So uh, I did a talk about pretty much going from zero to collecting metrics in yes. 60, 60 minutes. And this is uh, going back to Snowflake has a surprisingly high bill. Um, my demo environment from that talk ran up five hundred dollars in a month, and I because I forgot to turn off a couple of jobs. So thank you, Snowflake, for that. Uh, but uh, the a lot the point the point I was making with that talk is actually it's very easy to get started going from zero to I'm collecting some metrics about my data is very very straightforward. The hard part here is the, well, how do you know what's correct? How do you do the thresholding? Like we do a lot of time series anomaly detection in order to work uh, work on that. This is where going back to the point of you can build this yourself. You can actually have a very rudimentary version of Big Eye, and a lot of teams build it themselves. Spend about a year, two years using their own uh, in-house rudimentary version then they realize they're scaling out of it. And then they come talk to us and they say, well, this is how our things work. You need to support this and then some. And then that's usually a much easier conversation to be had. If anything, that's actually an easier conversation to be had than coming in to someone who hasn't built it themselves, because at least they're already thinking about data quality. Some teams just don't think about it. They know it's a pain, They but they haven't thought about what the solution looks like. And if you thought about it, it was wrong. You look from the eyes of the uh, old tools, SRE and logging and digital very, exhaust. Very, very often, yes. Very often, it's well. Our engineers say that uh, they're storing the right things, and it's like great. But you, if you update an enum or you update a column name, and you don't know what the impact of that is downstream, and no one's tracking it, then the the data team suffers. <laughs> I think this talk will be useful for folks watching in the future not to make mistakes and lose year to two on the projects, yeah. just immediately to ask for yeah. help on the tools. Do you have any trials? Uh, do you have any professional services hand holding to help people adopt? I, I like that with Fiverr and I wasn't left alone. Yeah, we every single person that talks to us, we assign a sales engineer. They are well versed in the tool. They're well versed in the data space, and they typically what they'll do is they'll talk to you and say. Great. What challenges do you have with your data today? What things break a lot? How uh, do you have any monitoring today? What do your pipelines look like? And we sort of help teach you how to one think about what should be monitored, and then how then help you instrument that. And then for some teams, even take it one step further, which is let's fold this back into your existing processes. What are you using to run your pipelines? How do let's teach you about our APIs and help you call out to our APIs and run metrics when you update your tables? And so um, we do have a lot of that hand hand holding. Um, we like it's more guidance than anything mm -hmm. because we you know your environment best. We know our product best. We just need to put two and two together. And do you have any trials? Like how long? Did, how long does it take for somebody to start seeing results? Uh, we typically do a, about two weeks worth of trial. You will often see results on day one because here is the dirty secret. Data is always broken. There's always something that's wrong. Um, uh, the question is, what is it and where is it? Uh, now, uh, a lot of times what this looks like is um, we have uh, we have a, a customer come in, they're using Snowflake. They're like, this schema really matters to us. These are the 100 most important tables. We use them for all of our analytics. We say, great, let's track how many records they're loading and how often they're being updated. And one of those tables will have not updated for uh, for too long, for like a, a day. And they'll say, oh, well, that's interesting. We didn't know about that. And that usually kicks off 
already kicks off an interesting conversation. And then from there, you can go even deeper. What does the data look like inside of it? Did you load data that was bad? Did you update an enum token? Nobody knew about it. Um, that sort of stuff kind of comes later. But usually, teams see value within the first few days. My father is law calling me. <laughs> Please <laughs> ask some questions while I answer. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions about data topics? I am more than happy to talk about anything data related, software related too. What are people's thoughts on Java? I like Java. We 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 do everything in Java in the back end here. That's cool. I will. <laughs> I'll okay. gladly argue about languages. Worked Sun when, when it started, I switched to Python. <laughs> this is good. Thank you so much. So what else? There are so many things I had. <laughs> Alphonse, anyone? Uh, we have a raffle to do like here. I will give you the link to the survey. So uh, Manning gives a free book. And then also, you can talk about the conference. Your team is coming to. Ah, uh, yes, uh, yes. Well, Thank I've, you for reminding uh, me. Thank you for reminding me, Daniel. Uh, if anybody is going to uh, Big Data and AI Toronto, uh, that is happening in two weeks now, I think. Uh, early October. I can find the dates. I think it's October 6th, 5th, 4th, and 5th. Uh, but Big Guy is going to be at uh, Big Data and AI Toronto. I actually think tickets are free. Um, if uh, I can find the link, actually, uh, Big Data and AI Toronto, uh, we will have a booth. We will be doing demos at the booth. So if you are interested in finding out more and getting a little bit more uh, personal uh, with the team, and then you can come find us at that conference. And my co-founder will be there. I will not be there, um, but my co-founder will. His name's Kyle. And I sent a link in chat to the conference. And then like I had this phone call coming. I didn't hear about the free trial. Do we have such a thing? Like, like it's how about this couple of weeks just to Yep, couple of weeks. We oh, we typically work with teams for two to three weeks, sometimes a month if they have a particularly complex data environment. Mm -hmm. Uh and then usually they will see value by then. Perfect, perfect. So folks, do the uh, 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 survey for money gravel, and then. Great. Any other questions? <laughs> Everybody's wild. It's it's late in it's late in Toronto. Mm -hmm. I know it's uh, it's East Coast time, so I get it. It's been a long day. It's already seven for uh, seven forty. Yeah. And, and there is lots of information to digest. I saw every talk you had, and still I was taking notes. <laughs> I like I like to bring new information to every talk. It's not very scalable, but I I personally enjoy it. It keeps it interesting for me. Yeah. So on on that note, like so there are no even books on this topic. People are totally confused. It's easy to go in the wrong direction. The first book that's coming is from another vendor, Monte Carlo. Yep. So it's a mousetrap kind of <laughs> like uh, I, I'm kidding. But if you can compare uh, uh, Monte Carlo to your product, because people will be looking there after the book comes out. Yeah, definitely. So uh, to the same point that I made earlier, we uh, Monte Carlo is exceptional at doing the. Um, Quick and easy stuff. They're sort of, they uh, sort of position themselves as the one button solution of you point us at your warehouse, uh, you you go and it goes and it, you just uh, it's going to find things for you. The thing that we've seen with Monte Carlo users is they hit a ceiling very quickly to the point of um, well, great. Now that we have the basic monitoring in place, um, how do I do something more complex? How do I look into the data deeper? How do I um, look at subsegments of my data. And this is something that we at Big Eye do very well. We have uh, UIs for that. We have APIs for everything, which allows our users to be very expressive. And we are um, going back to the automatic rules application. We we sort of we are trying to move more and more in the direction of express complex things and then automate it and have it apply. Um, so 
it's the it's sort of like going fast going zero to 10 very fast and then going from 10 to 100 very slowly or going from zero to 10 slower and then going from 10 to 100 faster that's the difference and um between big cool. and micro. thank you for sharing and then one of your competitors got acquired by ibm already like so it, you're talking about like how that yeah data band got acquired by uh ibm they the space is large uh we have a spreadsheet of competitors and adjacent competitors, um, especially companies that were unsure of how competitive they are. Um, but that spreadsheet at some point was 18 companies. So uh, there is a lot of talk in this space. There's a lot of companies. Companies are still coming out in this space, uh, which is astounding to me. For the AWS uh, DQ guys uh, started a company there recently. So uh, there is a lot of action, a lot of noise, given the economic situation in the United States, in the world. Um, the, the great consolidation is coming. VC money is, has, is drying up, and the great consolidation is coming. Luckily, we are in a very good position from that perspective. So the guy's not going anywhere. Um, in terms of um, in terms of the reason there are so many companies, uh, for example, like, you don't see anyone creating a new software observability company. No one wants to compete with Datadog. I don't want to compete with Datadog for that matter. Or when we started, we even asked them, we're like, are you guys going to do data observability? Because if you are, we just won't do it. Um, and they said no. And they're, they're, they've held true to their promise. Um, but the reason for this is it's a nascent space. And going back to that graph I showed, the, the need for data tooling and scaling data teams has come in the last five years. And there's still a lot of market to capture. There's a lot of uh, people doing things manually and in-house that could benefit from having tools. And I think the future of the space is really exciting. And there's going to be a lot of, lot of interesting uh, movement in the next year or two. Thank you. I, I'm really all you like. You're helping lots of people make less mistakes. And I wish you and your company really all the best. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, only five people did the uh, mining raffle survey. I will start sharing you. If you don't want to do the survey, you can paste your names here in the chat. And I will share the recording. Uh, it will be it's easy to remember. Like, yeah. And also, um, Nader, thanks for the uh, nice comment. I, I I tell this to everyone at every talk. I am more than happy to. Um, talk to you about anything data related anytime. Uh, my email is in the slides, Igor at bigeye.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn. If you message me on LinkedIn, I'll message you back as long as you're not a recruiter or a salesperson trying to sell me something. If you want a job and you're a salesperson, then we can still talk. Um, but <laughs> uh, Alexi, if, you know, question how Big Eye figures out what issue in which upstream table caused the data error in a monitor table. Um, yeah, so uh, specified table relations. This is the lineage question. Depending on your database, Big Eye may be able to infer lineage. Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift, we can infer lineage based on queries. Uh, so for example, if you say insert into table A, select star from table B, join table C, we know that table B and table C feed into table A. So if something's wrong with table B, probably something's wrong with table A. Um, the Tricky part here is this is highly dependent on the database and how you're generating your data. For example, if let's say you're using Snowflake, but you are using an external process to just write a giant CSV file into S3 and then load that CSV file into Snowflake, but we don't know where that data came from. We It's a file in S3, who knows? Maybe you pulled data from Snowflake, wrote it, and then uh, wrote it to uh, S3 and then wrote it back, but now we kind of lost track of it. So this is why, going back to the API topic, uh, we infer as much as we can, and we collect that information, but we also allow you to publish your own lineage. And a lot of teams publish their own lineage because they have, like I mentioned, external processes. They pull data out of, out of the database. They do some something in Python and Spark and R, and then they write it back, uh, write it back into the database. But 
that log isn't in the database. We don't know that that those tables fed into the downstream, and so they will manually declare their lineage. Because typically, if you're at the point where you're doing external processing, you have an advanced enough system where you're probably already declaring your lineage anyways. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, don't go. Uh, we need uh, to choose the raffle winner. Let's do it. So only five people pasted their name, so I did yours as well. Uh, anybody else uh, wants to, to put the name in chat? I will you donate know. my book. If anyone, <laughs> I will donate no, my book. No, it doesn't yeah. have to be book. It's anything. I know you're busy, too, but it, why not? Like You're the guest. Yeah, yeah. We no, can, if fair, you, if you win, like who knows? You have a good yeah. odds. <laughs> Anybody 16 else? 16 people on the call. Anyone else want their name? Yeah, right? Alphonse, okay. He didn't do it. Who else? Anybody else? Alexi. They're making it hard, but that's okay. We have time. Uh, who else? Alphonse, Alexi. Anybody else? Nadera. Okay. Okay. Is that good enough? Rob, you don't want it? Okay, let's see. Good luck. I love how there's a little website and app for everything, even spinning a wheel. Oh, my God. Well deserving, Alphonse. Hey. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he allowed me to post it his group. And this talk was not Google related, and he allowed me to post it in my too. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. This is this is amazing. So so thank you. You gotta look forward to learning more from you. So you Definitely. you know you have fan here and, and I know this recording when it comes out will help lots of folks not make mistakes I've seen people make and kind of make them navigate through the maze of modern data stack and all the products. I, I appreciate it. it. It was a pleasure to be here. I really enjoyed this. This is a great group. Uh thanks everyone for joining and listening, especially so late in the evening. And as I mentioned, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn or email. I'm more than happy to answer any questions or have any conversations about data. It's helpful. Thank you so much, Igor. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you.